having gone up on Mount Sinai, God gave Moses several things. He gave him the civil code of law, which we will find both in uh, Exodus 20 through 23 and in Numbers 5, 6, 15, 28 to 30. But he also gave him a building plan and he also gave him the criminal code of law. which we will find in Leviticus. The building plan is the building plan for what building? That's actually a false designation. It's not really a building, it's a tent. It's a movable tent. But what he's going to do is break down between furnishings, that means the ark, the table of showbread, the uh, menorah, the lampstand, um, various furnishings, then he's also going to talk to them about fabrics and the way to make the tenting and the linen exterior. He's also going to talk about fragrances, and by that I mean incense and oils that they are to use on their bodies so that you would smell God before you saw him, and also foremen, meaning the priests, but I needed an F. Okay, so these four factors will be the major factors of what he's going to tell us, but that's not why you read it. Knowing more about the fabrics of the tabernacle will make you win trivial pursuit questions on the tabernacle. I don't know what it does for you, but here's what I think it can help you with. If you understand the building plan, you'll understand the design of worship. If you understand the civil code, you'll understand the design of, oops, of civil society. What God it says is civility. If you understand criminal code, you'll understand the design specifically of redemption. This has to do with our walk with God. This has to do with our worship of God. And this has to do today with our witness for God. And that's the design for what we want to do. The very first place I want to go, though, is to a place of violation. I want to compare two events, one in chapter 24, of Exodus and one in chapter 32 of Exodus. It's going to be true worship and false worship. It's going to be essentially unmasking the imposter is what I call it for the chapter for that particular study. And here's what I want you to know. Real worship exists, but false worship exists. The real relationship between God and man is true and the true and living God wants to have that relationship. But there are religious imposters, and let me say it this way. In our world, the religious imposters outnumber the true worshipers. So in more cases than not, you're going to find somebody not doing it in accordance with the way God wants it done. Let's start off with a couple of ideas. Um, sometimes the difference between the true and the false isn't obvious. Uh, that's the nature of an imposter. An imposter is trying to look like the real thing. Sometimes it isn't even really clear to the person who's pretending that they're pretending, because that's the only thing they've ever known. They grew up pretending that there was a God in the room. You must understand that when man was made, he was made with a, a body, which is easy, a soul, which is his personality and the emotional attachments of it, and a spirit, which is his umbilical cord with God that was severed at the fall and reconnected in your salvation. Now the problem is, soul mimics spirit. 
Uh, the first time I realized this, I was standing in Tel Aviv and everybody was standing there waving lighters back and forth and crying as the band played uh, spiritual songs. But none of those people knew Jesus as their savior. And by definition in the scripture, that means they don't currently have a walk with God. They will, but they don't right now. And as a result, the fact that they were standing there feeling death, it looked like a, it looked like a Christian concert, except for there were no Christians there. So soul mimics spirit. You can go to a concert and be deeply moved with emotion, and that's not necessarily a work of the spirit at all. Or you could be standing there, and God could be working in your heart and you show nothing, but God is deeply at work in his spirit. You can't look at the externals and know what the internals are. I, when I was in high school, I used to think the quiet girls were all spiritual. Now, this is not true. May I go on record as saying this is not true? I've lived long enough to now know that the quiet girls are quiet. Okay, um, that doesn't necessarily mean they're spiritual at all. You can't look at the externals and get the internals. Here's what I can tell you. God gave some instructions. I want you to focus on them in the first two verses of chapter 24. It says, Then he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you, Aaron, Nadav, and Avihu, the 70 elders of Israel, and worship at a distance. Moses alone, however, shall come near to the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people come with him. So, what God planned was a corporate time of reverence. They were not allowed to go all the way up to be in God's presence where Moses was. So God wasn't saying everybody in leadership was equal. Moses was still going to be above him, but uh, above the rest of them. But what he was saying is that he wanted the corporate time of worship. So they gathered together. And, and, and it, if you drop all the way down to verses 9 through 11, what happened when they did this? They obeyed. They got there. And uh, they set up 12 pillars and they did all of this. By the way, put a box around verse 7 in chapter 24. Put a box around the whole verse. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will be obedient. That is the declaration of covenant. That's why we call this declarative law or civil code of law. It's the declaration that we swear that we will do what you have told us to do signed the people of Israel. But drop down to verse 9, and Moses went up with uh, Aaron, Nadav, and Avihu, and the 70 elders of Israel. That's exactly what they were told to do. And they saw the God of Israel, and under his feet appeared a pavement of sapphire, as clear as the sky itself. Yet he did not stretch out his hand against the nobles of the sons of Israel, and they saw God, and they ate and drank. This event was unprecedented in human history. Ever since the garden, this side of the fall, God had never walked among men in this way. So he was doing something huge. God passed by before the men, and they beheld a brightness that seemed like the sun. And the shocking part of the story was their response. They were called there to worship, and it says, they saw God and did eat and drink. In other words, here they are watching God go by, and they said, lunchtime, and they broke out lunch bags. Now that's just weird. There's nobody who can look at this and say, that's not weird. But you have to understand that in the world in which they lived, a meal consummated a covenant. And what they were doing was offering a covenant before the Lord by coming together. And as one man, they were eating together a covenant in agreement. Moses heard from Jethro weeks before this encounter that leadership needed to be shared. And Moses was trying. And God stepped in and said, let me add to that. Jethro not only told you the truth, but I want you to bring the boys up. I want them to see me pass by. And at the same time, the leaders needed to be reassured by Moses' unique position that, that God wasn't saying Moses is just like the rest of you. So Moses gets to go on to another place, but all of you at least get to experience some of what Moses is experiencing in a more intimate way. Now, this is the lesson. Leaders need to lock arms with other leaders. That's part of what they need to do. And one of the things that happens in our world is that we're sort of a lone ranger kind of mentality in the West. So we sort of think, well, good leaders stand out on their own and they don't have anybody locking arms with, they're just soaring ahead. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. 
What God says is that good leaders are bringing those other leaders along. Maybe not to the level of intimacy that they have, but along nevertheless. Our leaders fall into the trap of believing their own press and subscribing to the affir affirmation of the positive view of their followers. So people say, oh, you're so wonderful, and they believe it. People walk around, and one of the dangers in leadership today is you cannot, listen, you cannot lead in ministry if you feed off the affirmation of people. You can't do it. Because if you're going to be run by the crowd, then you're going to watch the parking lot for how many chariots pull up this week. And if, as long as you got more chariots, you're going to feel more successful. And that's not the way you can know whether you're doing what's right. Can we just get to the place where we all admit that sometimes the popular view isn't God's view and sometimes God's view isn't very popular? So if you're going to do it by polls, that's not leadership. That's followership. It's a dangerous tendency to distance ourselves from accountability, however. Just because, just because God has an intimate relationship with a leader in ministry doesn't mean that we distance ourselves from accountability. And so one of the things that happened here is God, in a way, helped the other leaders to see that Moses was walking with God. But in another way... He invited these other leaders to a new level in a walk with him that would add accountability to what Moses was doing. Now, I want to go back to verse 3 because I skipped over 3 through 8 to get there. When I took you to the mountaintop for the dinner party, I skipped this passage. It says, Moses came and recounted to all the people all the words of the Lord, uh, uh, of the Lord with the ordinances. And all the people answered with one voice, all the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. Which, of course, is pretty much a ridiculous response because they're not going to do hardly any of them and they're going to fall on their face very quickly. But nevertheless, verse 4, this is an accurate report of what they said, even though what they said wasn't true. Verse 4, Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. Then he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain with the 12 pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel. He sent young men to the sons of Israel and they offered burnt offerings and sacrifices, young bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. Notice that they are having offerings. They don't yet have a tabernacle. So that tribes are having offerings and it appears that they're having them in different places. What the tabernacle is going to do is be one of the fabrics that weaves together, pun intended, weaves together the idea that they are not 12 tribes, they are one nation. And so a singular place of worship. But in the beginning, they're all having their various places. Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins. The other half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. He took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will be obedient. And that's at verse 7. That's the declaration. Verse 8. So Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you in accordance with these words. Remember, remember that the civil code of law is separate but at the same time as the covenant. What is the covenant of God with Israel? I'll make you a great nation. It goes back to the covenant he made with Abraham. The law was a feature of the covenant, but not the same thing as the covenant. Don't do that. Christians interchange the law and the covenant. One has to do with God's promises to them. The other one has to do with regulatory issues of how they could know what their father cared about. They're not the same thing. You have a parent. You are their child. When you violate curfew, you're still their child, but now you're an in trouble child, okay? So there's a difference between the relationship establishment in covenant and the legislation involved in the law. That's what I'm trying to get you to see. Because later on in the New Testament, what's going to happen is you have been to Bible studies where people just move law and covenant interchangeably. The problem is they're related, but not the same. Okay. What I want you to see is this. Um, he goes up and he holds a ceremony to get the people on board with the law that's already been revealed. And and it would give them identity. The law would give them blessing. The law would give them a standard. The law would outline expectations. He gathered the people together and the people responded with open hearts. They saw God in power with the plagues of Egypt. They, they saw God's provision with manna and with, with quail. They saw God in direction with a pillar of fire and a, and a cloud. They saw God's empowering when they saw Moses' arms raised up and the Amalekites uh, being put down. They saw God in his rescue with the opening of the sea. All those things they saw, but they didn't know their God yet. 
And when the law was given, they still didn't. And when the covenant was affirmed, they still didn't. And the purpose of the journey through the desert, just like your purpose in your journey from the time that you come to know Christ till the time that you're living with him, that wilderness period is so that you will learn who God is. Because in the world, you got the wrong view of God. You got a view that was made and shaped by fallen men. But, but God wants you to see him as he is. It's interesting because each of those acts were acts of power, but they were also acts of preparation, weren't they? God was preparing them. When God does cool stuff in your life, it prepares you to listen to him next time. That's what it does. So there's a couple thoughts I want you to, to, to just introduce to you. First of all, allegiance, the allegiance to obedience in verse 3 seemed to be to a set of rules with little emphasis on a direct relationship to God. Moses intended to have the people feel a relationship with God himself like Moses did. Unfortunately, the people were content to do right, not have relationship. What, does, what do I mean? Go back to your youth group, the youth group that you came through. It's easy to get teens to believe that a relationship with God is a list of things they do right. Because when you pass through your teen years, much of your relationship with your parents is just trying to keep them off your back by doing right. I know that some of you, you know, angels sung above your bed and you were just the kind of child that got up and said, may I have a deeper and more meaningful relationship with my parent today? But most of you were just like, mom, would you just get off my back? And the thing is that people start in their view of God with how do I just get them off my back? And that's what verse 3 relates. It relates the idea that the people were more into keeping God off their back on a list of rules than having a relationship. God didn't intend that, and the rules don't make it that way. It's the way we are. The problem isn't the law. The problem's me. I'm what's broke. So then you get down to verses uh, 4 through 8, and it says that, that it does include the fact that young men helped in the slaughtering of the young bulls. And, and much of the emphasis of the ceremony from the perspective of the Israelites was a passive participation. Moses built the altar and Moses sprinkled the blood and Moses recited the law and everybody else watched. One of the big problems we have is that without participating in what God wants us to be doing, it's easy to become a spectator. So the first problem is you can make your allegiance to a set of rules instead of a, a relationship. And the second uh, byproduct of that is you can become a spectator and not active in your own participation. Now, without a hot heart, a passion to, to know and walk with God, people lose the, the acuity for true worship and they settle for form. I'm, I'm, I'm actually trying to say something. There's a lot of words there, but I'm just trying to say in the absence of a relationship, people fall back to a form. We pray this way, we go like this, we sprinkle this, we do that. And what happens is the form becomes more important than God himself. So you always have to have the offering after the first set of three songs. You can't do it with four songs because it's got to be three songs. Because then the offering won't get full or whatever. Well, what if we just got up and said, okay, this morning we're just going to preach and then we're going to do our singing after. You know what would happen? Most everyone in the room would be thrown off by what we're doing. Now, I'm not saying they couldn't worship. I'm saying they would all struggle. Why? Because we are people that rest in form. Every morning, I do the same thing. After stopping by the potty, I go down to check the coffee pot. If there's coffee in the espresso pot from last night, I love that because it's chewable now. And so what you do is you pour that in your cup, you put it 23 seconds in the espresso cup in the microwave. Not 24, not 22, always 23. You pull it out, dump your Splenda in, you stir it. Your eyes do not have to be open to do any of this. Then you slog it down, and you get the first half of that down, and you go, ah. Now, on those rare occasions that my son has dropped by and has emptied the pot, uh, which is every second day, I need to open up the pot and I need to make another pot. Again, your eyes do not have to be open for any of this procedure because the Bustello is always to the right of the other coffee. Okay, we do this for a reason because we're not yet awake when we create the morning coffee experience. 
Now, my wife prefers it when I make it in the morning because then I put it on the stove, turn it up to high, walk over and bring up my Bible thing for the day and see what it is I'm going to be looking at in the scriptures. And I bring up my, uh, usually my uh, uh, email alongside and see if there's anybody in the hospital or anything, emergencies. And by that time, the espresso pot has now, it's one of those little Cuban coffee makers, has now just starts to dump out on the stove, which is really what fills the house with that burned coffee smell, which is wonderful. And then I run over and shut it off. Now, by this time, if Magoo has not yet awakened, I will go through the little procedure of making my, my coffee. If he has awakened, I shut off the coffee machine, go and change a slimy diaper, and then come back, feed him, and then get my coffee. We love patterns. We love patterns. We brush our teeth pretty much the same way every day. If you actually stop and think about it, you always start in the same place. Why? Because you do. I have a little test. I'm going to tell you what it is. It's been used by missions, but it's also been used by governments. There's a way you can tell Americans, serve them pie, but don't point the pie toward them. Americans will turn the pie toward them before they begin to eat the pie. Russians will not. It's one of the ways Russians could pick out whether they were spies. I'm serious. People on the other side of the earth will eat the pie from the side if that's the way you serve it. We will always turn the point toward us, and we will not know we do. All the way around, just try it next time. Serve pie and watch everybody turn the point, point toward themselves. What's that? You don't have to eat from the point. Guess what? Guess what? If you eat from the side, it tastes the same, okay? Exactly the same. What's that? Oh, come on. Here's the thing. All I'm trying to say is that people love patterns. You are really cutting edge because several of you have sat in different chairs over the course of the school year. Ooh, ah. Some of you, on the other hand, can only hear from the chair from which you have begun the year. And far be it from you to move to the left or to the right. Okay, look, here's the point. Because we're pattern people, how many of you drove somewhere, you got all the way there and you don't even remember the drive? You, I'm not saying that you didn't drive well. I'm saying anybody cuts into your lane, you're gonna, your foot's gonna go right down to the, to the brake. It's unconscious now because you've become good at it. When you get on the bicycle, you don't go, okay, now, Right foot, go up on the pedal. You just get on and you take off. Why? Because you're good at it. When you get good at these things, these are subroutines. They're just like computer subroutines that are written. And your mind just does them. The problem is that a relationship with God can become a subroutine. That worship can become a subroutine. That we always sing it this way. We always raise our hands on this word. And, and, and it started off meaning something, but it ends up being a pattern. There is no way to have services with people, with hundreds of people, week after week after week and not develop a pattern. You'll drive everybody crazy if there's no pattern. Some people love to go, well, you know, we just, we just always doing something different. No, that's your pattern. And by the way, even in the randomness of every sixth week, I'll bet I can find out what you're going to be doing next. Because we're not random. We're really not. Here's the thing. The people agreed to form, but they lacked a passion for God. They agreed with the effects of God, but, but the, they didn't understand the beauty of God. They didn't, they didn't grasp the awesomeness of God. Their lives were about their needs. And so when God met their needs, then God was God. And when God didn't meet their needs, they're offended at God. Let me say it this way. I believe in verses 3 through 8, I can make the case that they pledged allegiance to his benefits, not to his person. Most of you passed all the way through your teen years still loving your parents' benefits and not them. What I mean by that is not that you, I love my parents. You don't even know them. Mostly you know them as parents, not as people. Why they care about what they care about requires you growing to the point where you're willing to listen. Would you like your relationship with your parents to become remarkably better? Let me suggest to you the way you do that, number one is by respect, and number two is by in inviting them to be people. Because when you sit down with them as people and stop making them, well, you're a parent, so you're supposed to know. That's not, they're just people. 
What God was doing here was he was giving them himself, but all they could see was the cardboard cutout. And because of that, when a test came up in their lives, they failed the test. L let me go on. In verses 12 through 18, the test in flushes out the imposters. The first thing that happens in verses 12, and it's said again in verse 18, is that God delayed. There was a delay of game that the people didn't understand. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain, remain there. Notice the words remain there in verse 12. And I will give you the stone tablets with the law and the commandments which I have written for their instruction. So the initial code of the civil code of law was handwritten by the finger of God. I'll give it to you, but you have to come up here and stay here, guys. God never gives an instruction without understanding exactly what's going to happen. So when he told Moses to stay there, part of that was a test for the people down below. And verse 18 picks up, Moses entered the midst of the cloud as he went up to the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. So Moses is alone with God, and he is waiting for God's instruction. Joshua is some distance away, according to verse 13. But the delay was God's idea, and I need you to see that. God said, come up here, now wait. Can I just say that if you can create the world and the cosmos in seven days, you can whip up some uh, texts of some laws in a matter of, you know, milliseconds? But God says, no, I want you to wait. And the delay is his idea because he's setting up the unmasking of the imposter so that Moses can learn a lesson here. Moses doesn't know these people that well. You think when you've read this that he's been together with them for 50 days. That's true. But mostly he didn't sit down like and have a one-on-one -on -one chat with all 50,000 of them. He's just leading the group. He doesn't know them. He probably doesn't know most of their names. He's probably got the leaders of the, of the elders of the people and that's about it. And so verse uh, you remember that Exodus 25.1 reminds, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Tell the sons of Israel to raise a contribution from every man whose heart moves him. Look at that phrase, moves him. You shall raise my contribution. So there was a delay, and then there's an instruction. And in that instruction, God says, I want you to go down and take up an offering. And the nature of our physical beings is that we need to picture God in some way. And God understood that. So he was about to give them a way to do it. Now, now I want you to notice God's gift here. Because in verse in, in, thir, uh, in, in, in 31, in chapter 31, later on, we're going to find out that God gave not only Moses the tablets, but he gave him a very special gift because those tablets were written in his own hand. That's why 31.18 says when he had finished speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses the two tablets, tablets of stone, written by the finger of God. The emphasis is on, look at what he's got. God delays him. God instructs him. God gives him this gift that's written by God's own hand. How cool is that? It's God's own creation. But here's what happens. I want you to stop there and jump all the way to chapter 32. Because what's going to go on up on top of the mountain and some details of the tabernacle take place between chapter 25 and chapter 31. I want you to go to 32 because this is what's going on at the bottom of the mountain. Okay? 32.1. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, does everybody understand then the continuity of the story? Now, meanwhile, back at the bottom of the mountain, the people saw that Moses was delaying. The people assembled about Aaron and said, Come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said, Tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, sons, daughters, and bring them to me. Then all the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took them from the, their hand, fashioned it in with an engraving tool, and made it into a molten calf that they said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it and Aaron made a proclamation and said tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord so the next day they rose up early offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play and the word play there is uh, with the connotation of sexuality now here's the bottom line when men wanted to in, in uh, invent a religion what did they do 
They became imposters of relationship. And the first thing they did was they spewed out these words in 32.1. We need a God we can control. That's what verse 1 says. We need a God we can control. Let's, let's, I want you to do something for us. I want you to make us a God who will go before us. Well, when people make a God, he's shaped in whatever they like. They're in complete control of whatever he becomes. The second thing is that, that man-made religion is designed to make people feel, uh, that, that feel inadequate, somehow feel affirmed. So what we're looking for is fill our void with something that will make us feel adequate. That's what the end of verse one's about. Fill us up with, with what we want. It's not a surprise that when you walk into churches where they're no longer teaching the word, they're teaching stuff that's very fulfilling and made up by them. Not tough to understand. It's what keeps people coming. So you give them some psychobabble week after week about how they can have a happier life and think positively and feel warm, fuzzy thoughts, and they come back next week. Here's the thing. Verse 4 says that they shaped God to their own liking. And, and when I'm reading this, here's the thing. Man-made religion doesn't exclude that God might be at work. It just doesn't matter because they're not about what God is doing. They're about what they want to do. We want to go somewhere, give us a God who will lead us. Well, wait a minute, if you invent him, how does he lead you? The thing I want you to understand is that there's worship and then there's religion. The worship of the God of heaven is about accepting him as he is. Does God understand you need to see something to worship? Yes. That's the reason why worship actually has with it services and things we do. That's why God gave a song as part of our worship. But the song isn't worship. It's just a song. My heart saying, God, you're worth loving and worth serving. Worth-ship. That was contracted to the word worship. That's what it is. Now, when we come back, I want to take a break. And then when we come back in chapter 25, we're going to very quickly look at furnishings, fabrics, fragrances, foremen, and we want somehow to introduce the criminal code of law because what we need to do is move very quickly now through the rest of Exodus and sort of see if we can get a lay of the uh, land of the tabernacle. And in doing so, what we're looking for is what? We want to see what's the designer pattern of worship. What did God do when he laid out his, can we say it this way, church, when he laid it out, how did he lay it out? What was most important? What was less important? What was the order of importance? What did you need to do to get in? Once you were in, how did you need to act? Those are the things that are related to the tabernacle. Okay?